In the television series Family Ties, there was an episode in which the parents discovered that their oldest daughter was failing a history class and might not graduate from high school. Her mother was visibly upset, terribly frustrated, and began to rebuke her by asking her questions. Mallory, how did you expect to pass? By going to the mall four nights a week? By dating Nick and talking on the telephone for hours at a time? With a perfect deadpan expression, the daughter said, okay, so that didn't work. Well, we understand that the humor there lies in its absurdity. How could anyone possibly hope to achieve anything, passing a history course or whatever, by not dedicating themselves to a course of action which would bring about the desired effect? Nothing worthwhile is accomplished haphazardly. We all recognize this fundamental truth that without goals, nothing is possible. The philosophy of goal setting applies to anyone who hopes to accomplish anything, whether it's an Olympic gold medal or, or losing weight. You have to have a goal, you have to have a plan, you have to have a system, and it must be adhered to. Yet do leaders in the Lord's church possess the proper attitude regarding goal setting? Let's eavesdrop for a few minutes on a typical business meeting at least typical of some of the ones I've been in, and maybe some that you have too. Uh, thank you for reading the minutes of the last meeting, Brother Jones. Uh, John, did you have a chance to check out the uh, price of the insurance premiums from those other companies that we inquired into? Well, I haven't heard back from all those companies yet, which is true since he only remembered to make the phone calls three days before the business meeting. Well, that's okay. Bring them next month. Bill, did you find out how much it would cost to print up flyers for our gospel meeting? A 15-minute discussion ensues on the price offered, after which one brother mentions that he has a third cousin who knows somebody in a town 70 miles away who could print them up very economically. Translate cheap. Well, that'll work. Well, now, is there any new business? Okay, it looks like we'll have a short meeting today. Oh, I nearly forgot. Sister Smith says that her classroom needs painting real bad. One of the men says, I can do a real bad job of painting it. And then they go on from there. The meeting is, uh, continues for another 10 or 15 minutes while they try to figure out who has the best price on paint, who makes the best paint, who has the most time available to pick up the paint, and who might do the painting. Since there is no other new business, the meeting is concluded with prayer in which God is thanked that we are so privileged to be a part of the church and have this opportunity to discuss the affairs of the kingdom. And that's how many business meetings go. I, uh, I have some worse illustrations, but I didn't think anybody would believe me. I once sat and listened to a 15-minute discussion as to whether Someone was entitled, a student in the Bible school was entitled to have a perfect attendance pen when they actually were on vacation two weeks, even though they had a letter sent back to, saying they were in Bible class there. And one person said, no, I think we ought to have different colors for the one who was here all 52 weeks. Well, do these types of things sound remotely familiar? It may be somewhat of an exaggeration, but unfortunately, meetings like this are all to come. The reason is that many congregations have no overall plan. They have no specific goals. Thus, a spur of the moment, troubleshooting approach to matters is what is taken. Whatever we must deal with receives the attention and all other problems will be postponed to a later time. This mop-up philosophy is based upon the premise that our main goal is taking care of of business, there is little room or time to make positive spiritual plans for the future. Suppose elders or the men of the congregation in churches that do not have elders were told by our heavenly principal that they were failing in their leadership course and that it was their fault that the church was not growing. The Lord might justly rebuke us 
How did you expect to succeed? By frittering away your time in meetings? By staying home and watching television four or five nights a week? By spending hours at a time engaged in various hobbies while the work of the church remains undone? And, and then with all accord, we could, like Mallory, say, okay, well, that didn't work. It's not quite so funny when we look at ourselves in that light, is it? And yet that is exactly the approach that many congregations are taking to accomplishing, quote, the Lord's will. Let's talk for a few moments about the evidences of deficiency that are in existence. If congregations are not growing and serving God as they should, there is a bottleneck somewhere. And as one astute person observed a few years ago, every bottleneck that I, was ever, that I have ever seen is somewhere near the top of the bottle. As others have noted, a congregation seldom rises above its leadership. What is the evidence that leaders, by and large, are failing? Well, the present apostasy, I think, is a pretty good evidence that leaders have not been trained, have not been educated, have not been taught to stand with the Word of God, and there's a pretty clear evidence that many congregations, elders have not fed the flock, and in fact have not even been fed themselves. They are obviously spiritually malnourished. Or we would not have the number of congregations departing from the faith. A second sign of inadequate leadership is that many churches have ceased to exist in the past decade. Others remain on the verge of collapse. And I can name some of them. You probably can too. Although there can be legitimate reasons for a, a church, to come to the point where the doors must be closed, such as maybe being a military congregation and the, the base is closed, or, or just simply no jobs and people are flocking somewhere else, and sooner or later the, there are not very many people left. But that is not the majority, uh, the reason the majority of the time. As the elderly pass on, if we have not been evangelistic, if we have not shown... Uh, signs that we understand that there is a work to do and we have not been busy doing those things, that as the elderly pass on, there will be no one to replace them. The old adage of grow or die certainly applies in these instances. Generally speaking, it is simply not the case that people flock in because we have a building and a sign out in front. They must be converted by Christians. It is particularly tragic that our own young people quite often are slipping through our fingers, perhaps because they have not seen the church as a whole or members of the congregation in particular that are living by faith. And in the absence of a good, strong, solid example, people oftentimes tend to look elsewhere. A third evidence that leadership is failing is that we are overall not growing. Now, of course, there are exceptions. But even discounting for the moment those congregations that have dwindled or already disappeared, many of those remaining could scarcely be considered vibrantly strong. Many of them are, are barely holding their own. How many faithful churches have had excellent growth say, in the past five years. Truly, we have a need for leadership to be discussed in general and goal setting in particular. Because our negligence in analyzing and evaluating and planning may very well be the reason that we are in our current unenviable position. If you would, please turn to Genesis chapter 11 and verse 6. We're going to read this in just a moment. Some people might protest, as we begin to discuss this, that a lack of growth cannot always be attributed to our shortcomings. After all, there is a great lack of interest on the part of many people to hear the gospel. We, we oftentimes have noted that fact, and of course uh, there is uh, some merit to that point. We could also point out that many people are interested in material things, and there's just no way to reach some of those people. And, and that's also true, but it would carry a, a bigger wallop if it were not for the fact that many people in denominations 
and many cults continue to grow and at a pretty good pace. People are interested in religion. Some people are interested in religion. Now this observation also should be made. Somebody will answer, well, uh, yeah, sometimes people are interested in religion, but they're not interested in the truth. And that has some merit also. But we might ask, have they heard the truth and rejected it? Or simply not heard it? In the absence of truth, have they settled for something, some inferior substitute? Are we not allowing some to out-hustle us who are reaching people that we're not reaching, who might be interested in the truth if we were there instead of them? And then there is the ultimate excuse to which we resort, and that is that, well, you know, Matthew 7, 13, and 14, says, Jesus said that only a few will be saved. Well, all right. We accept that. But how many people are there in the world today? About 5 billion plus. And how many members of the church are there? How many Christians are there? Maybe being very generous, five million? Now if we reduce five million over five billion, we have that come down to one in a thousand. And that, by the way, is being quite generous. Or 0.1% of the population. 0.1%. Jesus said the amount of people being saved would be few, not minuscule. 0.1%. That doesn't even classify as few. Yet, Jesus said few. And if we were ten times our size, that would only be 1% of the population. And I'm not sure that's even few yet. And a hundred times our current size would be 10%. That might get into the ballpark with few. So we have a long way to go before we qualify for few and begin to use that as an excuse for why we have not grown and why we are not accomplishing the Lord's will. Well, but someone might say, is it fair to set the blame for lack of growth at the doorstep of leaders? Yes. Where else are we going to put it? Well, we could put it with each individual member because we all have responsibilities. But primarily, it has to be at the doorstep of leaders. Perhaps it is time we repented and began making full use of the abilities that we have to do the things to accomplish the goals that God has given unto us. We stand guilty of refusing either to set goals or to follow through on them. Now such a broad statement can be made because there are those who are devoted to a cause, who have purpose and goals, and who will succeed because they are following those goals that they have set. Whatever we set our sights on, we can accomplish, and there will be nothing that is impossible for us. Let me say that again. If we make goals and set our sights on those things that we want to accomplish, there will be nothing that is impossible for us. Now I know somebody's thinking, at least one person's probably thinking, well, that sounds like Robert Schuller. Sounds like a little bit too much of that in there for me. But Robert Schuller didn't say that. It's in the Bible. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 6. And the Lord said concerning those who had undertaken to build the Tower of Babel, Behold, the people is one, and they all have one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Now think about the import of that verse. The Torah reads, by the way, on that tra uh, translates that verse, nothing that they propose to do will be out of their reach. The modern language Bible, nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. And of course the King James is saying the same thing, just in different words than those others have been expressed. 
nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. God's assessment of these people to accomplish their goal is based on one qualifying factor, their unity. Now, if we possess that kind of unity, which certainly ought to be the case in the Lord's church, we should be able to succeed also. The only other ingredient these people have that we do not have maybe is a goal. They imagined what they wanted to do. They had a plan for what they wanted to accomplish. They began to meet the deadlines to accomplish those things. They began step by step to implement that plan. And they were going uh, full bore to complete it. And if we did not succeed today, the reason is clear. We lack the vision. We have set the goals, but we're not meeting them. We are not working as we should. We have not begun to exercise the unity we ought to have to accomplish these types of things. It might be correctly pointed out that this civilization was in the process of violating God's plan to replenish the earth. If God had not intervened, nothing would have been restrained them. Since unspiritual men, which certainly these were, with an evil intent, can succeed in their clearly defined aims, how much more successful should brothers and sisters in Christ be when planning and accomplishing things in harmony with the plan and will of God? We can be successful, and not because some pop psychologist like Robert Schuller says so, or Norman Vincent Peale, because the Bible tells us that we can be. We can accomplish the goals that God has set for us. But before we talk about those goals that God has set for us, we want to establish the fact that God Himself is one who has purpose to bring things about and then has followed through on that. God set goals. We'll look at a number of passages of Scripture here very quickly, beginning with Matthew 25, 34, and then uh, we'll run through more or less in chronological New Testament order. Then shall the king say to those on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Prepared. Not haphazardly thrown together at the last minute. Prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Acts 2.23 Him, referring to Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands uh, have crucified and slain. Acts chapter 4, verses 27 and 28, For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast uh, anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, and the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. When did He ordain it? Before the world. He had a plan before the world. Ephesians chapter 1, 4 and 5. According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. 1 Peter 1, 18-20 For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation or behavior received by tradition from your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 
When was Jesus slain? From the foundation of the world. It was God's plan that Jesus die for the sins of mankind from the foundation of the world. Is it not obvious that God has had a plan? When man sinned, God was not surprised, neither was He unprepared to deal with it. And I know that that point will probably, or a similar point will probably be made at spring next week concerning premillennialism, that God was not taken unawares because of some so-called alleged thing to, to, that the kingdom was rejected, that Jesus was rejected, and therefore the kingdom couldn't be set up. No, all of this, including the church, including the kingdom, was planned from the foundation of the world. And He had already determined to send Jesus to be crucified by men with wicked hands who had no idea that they were fulfilling God's plan, but of course they were. And in fact, Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. God determined to adopt those who choose to be His and prepared the church for them, us. There is also an eternal kingdom of which we are part if we have obeyed the gospel that God planned from the foundation of the world. Concerning Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, the pulpit commentary says this, God's counsel that Christ should suffer for sins was not a vague, indistinct purpose, leading much to accident and the fluctuating will of man. It was determinate and defined in respect of time and manner and the instruments for carrying it out. Of course, the uh, commentaries are not always correct, but I think <clears throat> in this case you'll agree that they hit it right on the nose. In other words, God devised the great scheme of redemption for mankind and then brought it about <clears throat> in the fullness of time, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. Jesus likewise had goals when He departed from heaven to live upon the earth and to come to this land. His very name means Savior. And He came with that mission in mind to save the lost from their sins, to seek and to save the lost, Luke 19.10, Matthew 1.21. He also came into the world to bear witness of the truth, John 18.37, to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 8. He did not come to the earth and come to an age where he began to understand uh, and study the law and, and do all those things and then say, well, now that I'm here, what do I do? That's how I think a lot of us might have approached it, judging from the lack of effects that we have had. But it's not how God plans things. He knew what the purpose was. Jesus, likewise, died on the cross which was according to the will of God, planned from the foundation of the world, and willingly did all that God had uh, required of Him and sent Him to do. The student of the Word realizes that not only has God had plans and goals and implemented them and executed them perfectly, not only did Jesus do that, but many of the faithful followers of God have done likewise. Abraham, for example, in Hebrews 11.10 Look for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's what he was thinking of while he was living upon this earth and doing the various things, moving from locale to locale. He was looking for a permanent home. Moses, Hebrews 11.26, had his eye on the recompense of reward. Paul's goal was to pressed toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, Philippians 3.14. And these constitute just a small sampling of biblical heroes imitating the example that God set of having goals and living in such a way as to follow through not being deterred by anything. Well, what are God's goals for the church? We do not have to spend a lot of time setting general goals because God has already done that for us. There are at least th uh, four things that the Scriptures emphasize. The first one is evangelism. Jesus established this priority before going into heaven. Matthew 28, verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach 
all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This will be the primary purpose of the church until the Lord returns. Preaching the gospel to the lost throughout the entire world may seem like a great undertaking, but the enormity of the task for us is no greater than it was for those of the first century or will be in every other century. Can we succeed? Remember that even of those pursuing evil ends, God said nothing will be impossible. We also have the promise of the Lord to be with us. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Matthew 28, 20. Now, we could fulfill this commandment if enough leaders would meet and formulate a plan and cooperate in its implementation. Now, we're not suggesting for a moment by this some new version of a missionary society but simply the exchange of ideas and, you know, how could we be of help here and who could go there and who could we contact about this? We have enough people of vision, I am persuaded, to do this. If we could be united and devoted to bringing this about. We need to have the attitude that Paul expressed, and of course many do, but we need more. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 22, when he said, I have made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. We must have that passion, that desire, as Paul expressed it. And in many cases, the church in many locales seems to have lost that kind of fervor that we used to uh, possess to a wider degree than what it appears we have now. The second general goal the Lord gave the church is that of edification. This concept would be included in teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, Matthew 28, 20, and a number of other passages. In fact, it is, as has been pointed out so ably this week, the duty of the elders to feed the flock of God. Many congregations have not devoted themselves to making sure that the whole counsel of God is presented. There are many places where biblical lessons are presented each and every week, but not the whole counsel of God. There may be some subjects that are taboo for the preacher to speak on. There may be some things that are just not dealt with. It has to be the whole counsel of God. And by the way, Michael, despite all of the best efforts, somehow Matthew 29, 20 got in here on that verse, but I'm assuming that in a group this intelligent, Having especially read that verse twice more on this page, you'll know what that really is. A third area of emphasis is benevolence. Generosity as a way of life in the first century church seems to have almost been automatic. Immediately, all that believed were together and had all things common. Acts chapter 2 and verse 44. Shortly thereafter, no brother said that all of any of the things he possessed was his own, but they all had all things common. Acts 4 and verse 32. The spirit of goodwill did not cease, but many decades later, brethren were still setting aside contributions for the poor in Jerusalem. 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5, and chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. Admittedly, it's difficult in a nation as prosperous as America for us to practice benevolence as people once did because there are so many government programs taking care of things, and maybe our attitude is, well, let the government handle it. But regardless of what anyone else does or does not do, the church has responsibilities in the area of benevolence. And we need some who have vision to design a dynamic program or means to help those who are in need. The fourth goal that the church has been furnished is to earnestly contend for the faith in Jude verses 3 and 4 and a number of other passages. I'd like to look at Jude 4 for just a moment. It's one that uh, we're familiar with, and yet some brethren apparently are not familiar enough with it. Jude verse 4. We read that there are certain men crept in unawares. And now we, we know from paralleling this with Second Peter 2 that these were members of the church. I mean, these were not people out in the community or atheists coming in. These were members of the body of Christ who were doing this. 
They have crept in unaware who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, during the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how are they doing that? Are they standing up and, and saying things like, well, I don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Are they standing up and saying, well, I think we ought to be immoral? No. They're doing it, though, by their teaching. By their teaching, they are saying, and the result of what they are saying is that people are practicing ungodliness. For example, the men who are going around the country saying that it is all right to be unscripturally divorced and remarried is what exactly comes to mind as a, a application of this verse. And you know what happens? We have leaders, quote, or elders, who invite these men in to teach about the spiritual matters. And people go away saying, oh, that was so spiritual. He's such a spiritual man. You know what the Word of God says? He's an ungodly man. I didn't say that. The Word of God says that. Anybody who tells people that it's all right to persist in immorality is an ungodly man turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. And those men ought not to be fellowship and invited in to host spiritual workshops of any kind. One wonders if some shepherds sopped and saturated with superficial sweetness would even admit that Satan himself is a liar and that he deceives people. One wonders, and even if they did admit that by some chance, would they stand up and oppose such an individual? Let's talk about specific goals for a moment. These are going to have to be tailored to each individual congregation to see what you can do in the area in which you live. There are some things that may work well in one area and won't work in another area. So these things need to be evaluated and we need to then to set the goals and then determine how to achieve those things. In his assignment for the annual Benton Lectures, Roy Deaver did an excellent analysis of Nehemiah as a leader listing 22 qualifications of this great man. His fifth and ten points are, before taking action, Nehemiah surveyed the situation, gathered the facts, studied the facts, made the plans. Now that makes sense. And then his tenth point was he carefully systematized the work to be done. And that makes sense. J.J. Uh, Turner has given these points. Evaluate honestly the congregation's situation. All right, do that. Number two, recognize the challenges that God has set before us. These are not things we're trying to do under our own power, but that God has set forth that we need to accomplish. Number three, detail the means by which these objectives are going to be met at the local level. And then, if, if possible, you know, beyond the local level, but at least that far. Number four, work the plan assigning deadlines. Now, you can have the greatest plans of all, and then nothing will happen if deadlines are not set. And month after month, well, I didn't do that. Uh, we didn't get that done. You have to be insisted upon these things. And then reevaluate and start all over again. The 13th observation that Deaver made about Nehemiah was this. He realized and stressed that he and the people were instruments in the hand of God. And we've seen this with the study of uh, Joshua. And we've seen this with uh, others that have been and will be presented. These were men of faith. And there have to be examples of men of faith, people who, like Hezekiah point out, uh, point out in 2 Chronicles 32, 8, with him as an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. We have to realize that these are God's chores that we're doing, His goals, His tasks, and that we are privileged to help and to be His instruments. God will neither leave us nor forsake us. What more motivation can God's people have to be about the Father's business? The work is exciting and enjoyable. The rewards are enormous and eternal. Let urgency permeate every congregation of God's people on earth. And let us move forward to conquer all that lies between us and the goals that God has set before us. 
Let's conquer everything from legalism to liberalism, from literalism to deconstructionism, from lethargy to zeal without knowledge. As Joshua and Caleb told Israel about the peoples of Canaan, they are bred for us. And their defense has departed from them. The Lord is with us, not them. Fear them not. If we take to heart these goals, do the evaluation as we ought to, then again we will be successful because nothing will be impossible for us.